Good morning, everyone. So, uh, as was sort of hinted at, uh, we incubate game startups, independent game developers and studios. We have an investment fund uh, based in Canada, but we do deals all over the world. So, particularly excited to be here uh, in Lebanon to see some of the talent uh, and studios here and see if we can find uh, someone to, uh, to invest in. Um, prior, wait, which button do I? Pri prior to um, starting Execution Labs, I actually did a lot of work with uh, governments around the world, uh, helping them on regional development, cluster development, specifically for games, how to support and grow game industry, uh, and so I was going to focus a bit more on that today as opposed to just the, the uh, investment side of things. Uh, whenever I'm in uh, foreign lands with new cultures, I like to tell some stories about sex. Um, Daphne is not my girlfriend, it's the name of a waterfly. Uh, and uh, this waterfly has a particularly interesting sex life uh, in that if the environment is stable, uh, it does not have sex to reproduce. It just clones itself. Uh, I'm not a biologist, don't ask me how it works, but they, they make an exact copy of themselves and that is you know, the offspring. What's interesting is when the environment is disrupted, when the environment is unstable, then they start having sex to reproduce. Uh, and you know, that's not because they think the end of the world is coming, so it's time to have fun, but more so to introduce error and mutation and adaption into their offspring. Meaning that the whole you know, the process of sex combining DNA introduces errors into, uh, into, the, into the reproductive process with the hope that one of those errors or one of those mutations is better adapted to the disrupted environment. So maybe uh, you know, the, the, the offspring is a different color so the predator can't see it, or if there was a drought, it requires less water, or if there was a lack of food supply, perhaps the stomach is smaller, uh, and that's what enables that new mutated offspring to, to survive. And I, 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 when I read about this particular creature, I thought it was quite interesting um, in that it does in many ways serve as a metaphor for the industry uh, that we're in, the game industry that's always in a state of disruption, it's always a state of instability, and so cloning ourselves, doing what we did to succeed yesterday, or a different region that was doing to succeed, uh, it is, unlikely to, is unlikely to work. And so I always think of the game industry as a system, as an ecosystem that we need to think about. We need to think about the inputs, the outputs, all of the variables at play, uh, and, it, and it's quite complex. Uh, I mean, it's complex, uh, particularly in the game industry, uh, because of this notion of disruption, that it's always in a state of change, that we can never just sort of do what we were doing yesterday. Uh, but not everyone necessarily thinks about the game industry in this sort of ecosystem way. I was very happy. The one word that caught my attention this morning from His Excellency was the word of supporting the ecosystem, of building an ecosystem. One of the things that you have to think about is, what, what is this ecosystem producing and the most important thing in my mind is IP, intellectual property. Now what tends to happen is governments generally are focused on job creation. Right? They want to establish companies or support the creation of companies so those companies can hire workers and then those workers can pay taxes and be sort of you know, viable or good citizens within the community, all this kind of stuff. Which of course is a, is a very admirable goal, it's a very good thing to do. Uh, but I think ultimately is not really what the goal should be. All of those initiatives, efforts, you know, supporting the ecosystem should be about generating intellectual property because the true wealth and value in the game industry flows through intellectual property, through, through game, game IP. Uh, and so a lot of the work that I had done with governments was to help them sort of rethink their role in that traditionally they've always been thinking in terms of headcount, creation of jobs, without necessarily thinking about you know, the value of those jobs or what those jobs were for. Uh, and so I would, do, I would work with regions who, let's say the easiest way for them to get jobs was either to invite foreign companies to set up operations, or in some cases you know, provide call center services or uh, 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 software testing services, which is, uh, I mean, those are fine businesses, but, but relatively low in terms of scale of, of value creation. Uh, as opposed to creating real wealth, which is through uh, the intellectual property. Um, and so whenever I think of you know, the game industry and who needs to be involved in the ecosystem, it's really this kind of triad or triangle of, of, of stakeholders. 
Uh, all the gamers are in the room are, are laughing because they know what this triangle is better. Um, so it's really this, this sort of rich collaboration between industry, government, and academia, and all of them should be focused on IP, and also to a lesser extent, talent development, workforce development. Um, and the regions that develop the fastest or, or the most, have the most robust development, you do see that interaction. Whereas in the regions that are, are stalling or have a really hard time, one or two of those stakeholders or corners of the triangle are absent in, in that discussion. Um, and so of course, you know, each sort of corner provides resources and, and support to the other. You know, government, whether it's providing funding or tax breaks or legislation to facilitate uh, game industry or academia providing uh, knowledgeable workers uh, or industry providing research opportunities or funding uh, to, to academia or, or even in some cases the government providing funding for, for certain kinds of research and so on. You know, the, the, there's a lot of opportunity to communicate, to collaborate, to provide resources uh, and value, value back and forth. So, I mean, again, this morning, really interesting to see a mixture of industry, academia, and government uh, on, on stage. So very, very encouraging. Um, another one is this notion of, of top-down end bar, right? That you want to see uh, high-level support from the top, saying this is important, we recognize the value, uh, you know, we're going to push for this. But at the same time, you want bottom-up. Right, you want people on the ground, developers, creators, artists, entrepreneurs, who are saying, you know, we're building companies, we're building value, we're building intellectual property, we need support. And then, they, you know, from the top down, from the bottom up, they, they, they meet in the middle. I've been in many regions where, where you don't have that sort of bi-directionality. That you have someone in the government who says, we hear games are sexy, let's make more games, and there's no one in the ecosystem to talk to. There's no entrepreneurs, the artists aren't, aren't there yet. Or what happens more often is you have the developers on the ground who say, you know, we're building something here, we need some support to compete on a global scale, and no one in the government or no one higher up really cares or is paying much, much attention. That, that's happening less and less and less today, but still, still is an issue. So again, in those regions, in those ecosystems that are developing the best and more robustly, you see this rich collaboration and, and sort of motivation from the top down as well as the, as well as the bottom up. Um, another thing that is quite rare is, is something I call the sort of three, three circuits or three lenses through which I look at the game industry. Uh, so so one, one such lens is, uh, is technology. So this is an obvious one. We, we view games, the game industry, as a, as a technological industry. All, all of the chips and the telecom companies, uh, the devices we use, all the gadgets, it's code, we're involving computer scientists and engineers. Uh, you know, it's easy to understand games and the game industry from a technological point of view. Uh, the other one is the business side. Uh, you know, we heard this morning already some statistics about how many players are playing, the, the dollar size, the, the sales, the, the increase. Uh, I mean, it is quite impressive. Uh, what most don't recognize is that so much value in the game industry really has been created through business innovation. It's not just about technological innovation, but it's innovation in terms of business models uh, really have to, what am I doing something wrong? No, you want your, okay. I'm not interesting enough to, that's all right. I'm okay. Uh, oh, that's fine, T take, take it, go. Um, where was I? You are, yes, I'll, I'll, speak, I'll speak in French. Um, Okay, so, so uh, a tremendous amount of value has actually come from business innovation. And I would say in many ways the game industry is at the forefront of business model innovation, digital, digital uh, business models and so on. But um, again, so, so we're all here at a conference. Generally speaking, we have a business mindset and do view games as an actual business. The other one, uh, or the third lens, is, is uh, design. I, I just pulled my it's fine. Anyway, so, oh, yeah, fun. Uh, so design, so the other one is design. That these are uh, designed artifacts, that, that they are artistic, there, there is a certain aesthetic value, uh, there is, um, you know, whether it's, whether it's art direction or music, audio production, acting, writing, so, I mean, th these are uh, really uh, designed works, they're work, works of art. Uh, and then what we have to remember 
is, of course, that it is culture. Uh, this sort of, sort of dovetails nicely with what Kate is saying, is that you do have to recognize that games are a cultural artifact. That a reason why we are so passionate and the people making them care so much is because it is, it is culture. It's a form of human expression. Uh, and in fact, you know, going forward, the sort of interactive nature of, of games really is or will be one of the most powerful forms of, of personal expression in, in the world and, and most, most powerful forms of, of art. Uh, and if you don't recognize that, if you're not building the ecosystem around that notion and respecting games as culture, both from the creator's point of view, but more so from the consumer's point of view, the player's point of view, um, you know, it just means that you'll advance the industry at a slower pace. And so the regions that recognize that, that respect games, the power of games, uh, you know, really does create a more, a more robust uh, ecosystem. Uh, and then that culture, I mean, you do have to then think about what that means from a region to region basis. I'm, I'm from Canada, and so the cultural context within which games are made there from the technological business design point of view is quite different than other regions, and we have our own successes and some failures based on that context. Finland is another country that's doing extremely well that's often looked at. I mean, Canada and Finland are often looked at as models uh, for, for growing a game ecosystem. Uh, completely different contexts, right? They have, they have you know, as much success as Canada does, but the nature of government intervention, how the academic and, and talent pipelines are set up, how funding works, how the industry is structured, uh, between the two of them are, are quite, quite dramatically uh, different. Uh, but both regions, both countries understand and respect games as, as culture, and I think that helps drive uh, that, that, that advancement. Uh, and in that sense, you know, much like the, the Daphnia, who cannot succeed if they just clone themselves, also as a, as, a, as a city, as a country, as a region, obviously you can look to other countries, other, other successes for inspiration, but you do need to think about what's special about here, what's different, what is the cultural context, what is the business climate, what kind of opportunities do you have for technological innovation, and create something that's unique and different and special uh, for this region, because at the end of the day, th there is no stability. Everything is always in a state of disruption, so we always have to be adapting, we always have to be mutating, we have to be agile, and only by being agile can we be successful. So I encourage you to all be sort of mutants, or, you know, to adapt and, and be successful in, in your own ecosystem and context. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>